Is anybody like me? If you're like me, say amen. That was awfully dangerous. Oh, my soul, that was so dangerous. But um, as we're going in, we're having this uh, Make and Change Financial Focus Weekend. And uh, I started thinking about finances. And I don't know why this sort of came to mind. Does anybody ever watch uh, the uh, guys that ride the bulls? Anybody ride the bulls? Ride the, you know, what you call that? Rodeo, bull riding. Anybody? Yes, yeah, that's it's going to get deep this morning, folks. Get ready. <laughs> that was a hard question. You ever seen them get on those uh, bron- the Broncos and the Bulls? And uh, I just get tickled. Now, I would never want anybody to get hurt, period. No jokes. I don't want anybody to get hurt. But I do get a little bit tickled, man. You got them in there, and I got the cowboy hat. And I've always wished I had a head for a cowboy hat. I, mine's too small. I'm just getting golf bomb, you know. Everybody talk about the 10-gallon hat. I'm looking for the three-and-a-half-gallon hat, you know. Golly, y'all are terrible. Uh, but anyway, you know, they're, they're in there, and they got the, they got the bull, you know, and they're, they're, they're doing the gloves, and they're you know, cinching up that thing and all this kind of stuff. And then, <laughs> then the guy looks at some other guy and goes, and that's the worst mistake that he could ever make in his life. Because they open that gate, brother, and, that, I mean, it just amazes me the power of whether it's the, the, the horse, especially those bulls. Oh, my word, it's just amazing. And they're doing that. In my head, I know it's like eight seconds, right? And I'm like, you know, I think if you write it for eight seconds, that's what you're supposed to do. All right, so in my mind, I'm going one, one thousand, two, one thousand. And usually you get about three, one thousand, and there's body parts flying everywhere, okay? Well, welcome to our finances. Because we are supposed to have control of our finances, but yet many have come into the house of God this morning and your finances have control of you. And trying to get a hold of those finances is trying to ride that mean bull for eight seconds. And you can get your gloves ready and you can get roped in and tethered in and you can have your hat and your clothes and everything and you can have every T cross and all your eyes dotted, but all of a sudden it's like the gate of life opens And man, you are holding on for dear life. One person said this, if you want to feel rich, because so many people are about being rich and having uh, substance, right? If you want to feel rich, just count the things you have that money can't buy. Benjamin Franklin said this, he said, money never made a man happy yet, nor will it. The more a man has, the more a man wants. Instead of money filling a vacuum... It creates one. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great poet, very successful man, chew on this quote for just a moment. Ready? It's going to require some chewing. He said this, money often costs too much. Mm. James Frick said, don't tell me where your priorities are. Show me where you spend your money and I'll tell you what they are. And so all of a sudden, money, I mean, we're not supposed to talk about money in church, and all churches talk about money. If you've been around Newton, I don't preach on money. I preach book by book, verse by verse, through the Word of God. When we hit stuff, I want to hit stuff. And this being a financial weekend, and people are being thrown like crazy off the financial bull of life, I want us to maybe gather some things that will help us to have a foundation within our finances. There was a preacher named John Wesley. He was known for one of the ones that started the Methodist Church. And the Methodist Church began because of their methods, their methodology. They were very, very, very disciplined in what they did. The Methodist Church is where the old-time camp meetings and tent revivals originated from, to my knowledge. And so John Wesley was just a very godly man, a very strong man of the faith. And he says this. I want you to listen closely, if you don't mind. Get all you can without hurting your soul, your body, or your neighbor. Save all you can, cutting off needless expenses. Give all you can, be glad to give, and ready to distribute. Lay up in store for yourselves a good foundation against the time to come that you may attain eternal life. And I started thinking about John Wesley, and I started thinking about that that thought, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, how in the world do I reconcile these three things? Ready? How in the world do I reconcile, earn all, earn all I can... How in the world do I reconcile, earn all I can, with save all I can? And how in the world do I reconcile, earn all I can, save all I can, and then give all I can? I started thinking about Bible principles and what the Word of God has laid out. And with warning lights, Paul had told Timothy about those that, well, they weren't going to follow the Bible. They were going to use the Bible. They were going to use God. He says in 1 Timothy 6, he says, verse 4, that this man is proud. 
knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, he warns and says, from such, uh, withdraw thyself. He says those that are going to serve God to get rich, those that are going to use God to get gain. He's like, they're so deceived. He says, but understand this, a way a man does get rich is godliness with contentment. Now that is great gain. Serving God does not make you rich, Paul is telling Timothy, but it will make you rich if you're satisfied with what you have. See, a content man and a content woman is a very wealthy individual. He says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. You and I own nothing, friends. We are stewards of the blessings of God that we must give account for. And having food and raiment, he says, let us be therewith content. But now they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, uh, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition or judgment. He says, for money is the root of all evil. Is that, cru- is that true? Is that true or no? Amen or no? Money's not evil. Money's neither evil or, or good. Money is money. It's paper. It's stone. It's gold. It's silver. It's dollar bill. And those are getting to be worth even less. And so money, money in and of itself, it's nothing. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. And this love of money, this covetousness, this, this greed, this uh, jealous and envy for things, this materialism, he's like, it draws us from God. People have coveted after it, he says, and they have erred from the faith, and they pierce themselves through with many what, church? Pierce through with many? There was a lady, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, I don't think anyone has uh, knocked this lady off as of yet, I don't know for a fact, but she was in the Guinness Book of World Records, and her name was Hetty Green, and she was in there for being the greatest miser who ever lived. Hetty Green, when she was about 30 years of age, her father died. And her father gave her the family fortune, which was at that time equivalent to about $100 million today. And in Wall Street, it wasn't really at that time a common thing for a woman to be involved so heavily in banking or investments. Uh, Hetty went totally crazy with this family fortune, becoming intoxicated with getting more and making more and building the family fortune. She became so engrossed with this that she divided her family and scattered them, her husband, her sons. She became so in, in just enamored with making this money that she would eat cold oatmeal because she was not going to spend the money on what it would take to heat up the oatmeal. She would take her dress and she would wash the bottom uh, rimming of that dress because she didn't want to spend the money on the soap that it would take to wash the whole dress. Her son Ned documented Ned was, broke his leg as a boy. And Hetty, though she had so much money, she took her son to a, a free clinic for the poor. And when they would not treat her because they knew who she was, she took him home. Ned's leg, because of her lack of getting him medical care, Ned's leg had to be amputated. Hetty started out, Hetty started out with about $100 million. And she was so intoxicated with building and building and building and just became a miser of all misers. When she died, the equivalent of her hundred million had turned into a four billion dollar family fortune. She divided, she died alone, and she died miserable, and she died unsatisfied. But she had four billion dollars. And sometimes in our life, the devil whispers in our ear that if I just had a little bit more. If I had this, this year truck, or this year car, or that size house, or this many acres, or that boat, or that lot, or that this, or that much in the savings account, or that much in the checking account. And so all of a sudden, Ecclesiastes will talk about you and I are chasing an empty dream. It's a, a breath that we try to reach for, and our hands go through. The, Ecclesiastes defines it as vanities of all vanity. All is vanity. And we come to the money and the finances, and people are trying to chase, and you would think that if you, you and I are sitting here going, hey, you know, if I had $4 billion, would you be happy with $4 billion, amen or no? Nobody wants to answer. 
Because the truth of the matter is, if I'm not contented with four dollars, it doesn't matter if I've got a billion of them. Contentment is not the amount of, amount of something. Contentment is based in, on, on my relationship with God. And so I want to give you very quickly this morning, to the best of my ability, you have the notes, they, I think they passed out the notes. Uh, I want you to fill in, and I would humbly ask you to study this, because there's so many verses uh, on money, I think there's over 2,000 references to money and the Word of God. Uh, Jesus preached on money about more than anything. Uh, it was, it's just amazing, amazing, because He knows that where my heart is, that's where, or where my treasure is, that's where my heart's going to be. So let me give you some things, going back to John Wesley's quote about, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can, and let me fill in some blanks for you. Number one, ready? It, on, on your outlines, foundation number one, it's not wrong to earn money. It's not wrong to earn money. It's just wrong to worship it. It's not wrong to earn money. Uh, you and I should be hard workers. Uh, we should be hard workers. But the key word that I want you to put under that point is, well, it's not wrong to earn money, just to worship it. The key word is purpose. Purpose. See, God has given you the ability to, to earn wealth. God has given you the ability to work a job. God has given you the ability to get gain for a purpose. And what you and I must do is we must, we must seek and ask God, God, what is the purpose of why you've given me the ability to work, to earn wealth, to get gain? How do you want to use it in and through my life? God, how do you want to use it in and through my life? Because God is a God of purpose. He never wanted money to be worshipped. He never wanted gold to be worshipped, never wanted jewels to be worshipped, never wanted diamonds to be worshipped, and never wanted something as silly as paper. He never wanted it to be worshipped. He says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. He is to be God of our life. And so all of a sudden, we're looking within our life, and we're saying, why do I earn? Uh, why do I earn? Why do I work? What is the purpose of what I'm doing with my life? And I, I'll give you this. I read this, and it, and it was quite convicting. i just share it with you. You let the Holy Spirit do as He would in your life. If you're saying, preacher, I don't worship money. You know, we, the point is, is so it, we, it's not wrong to earn money. It's wrong to worship it. I don't worship money. I don't worship money. I want to give you something I read that uh, slapped me. And I don't want it to slap you, but I do want it to maybe, maybe for you to chew on it. Ready? Let me read it for you. Suppose, he says, someone were to offer you $1,000 for every soul that you earnestly try to lead to Christ. Would you try to lead more souls to Christ? Is it possible that you would attempt for money what you hesitated or shrinked from doing now in obedience to God's command? Is your love of money stronger than your love of God or souls? And I'm sitting there and I'm reading this. I'm like, wow. If we were to pay people to come to church services, would they be in more church services? If we paid people to give out tracts, would they give out more tracts? If we paid people to serve in life groups, would more people serve in life groups? If we paid people to go out soul winning, would there be more soul winners? And so all of a sudden, is anybody with me, amen? It takes the air out of the room, doesn't it? Because I'm sitting there in my, my office and I'm typing up and man, the Holy Spirit is just, just, just really challenging my soul. And then I read this and it's like, man, the keyboard fell apart. The air went out of my office. Because I want to think, you know, I've got a pretty good handle on money. I've got a pretty good handle on giving. I've got a pretty good handle on idolatry. I've got a pretty good handle on covetousness. I've got a pretty good handle on jealousies and envies. I've got a good handle on this, right? And the Holy Ghost went, pow! And I, I was like, wow, would I do more for the Lord out of love? Or would I do more if somebody gave me more money for it? And so it's not wrong for you and I to earn money. We're just not to worship it. And if we're not careful, it has just a sneaky way of embedding itself into our hearts, into our lives. God gave, Genesis 2.15, God gave Adam a job. He gave him a, a, a job in the garden of delight. That's what Eden means. It means pleasure or delight. And God's given you a job and the ability to get wealth and the ability to serve and the ability to think and the ability to do. God has blessed you and me with that ability. And with that ability, I have a purpose for my life and you've got a purpose for your life. The purpose for my life is not any better than the purpose for your life. And God gave Adam a job before sin. Work was not a curse of sin. God gave him responsibility. We're not going to get to heaven. And our whole heavenly experience is not going to be a hammock, grapes, and fishing in the crystal sea. I know I just blew some of y'all's bubble, but now you don't want to go. 
But it's not. How in the world can it be heaven when he looks at it and he says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'll make you, uh, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over. How in the world, who are you going to rule over? Other great Peters? I don't mean it ugly. Heaven's going to be bliss. Heaven's going to be worship, full of worship. But you're going to have responsibilities. I'm going to have responsibilities. Adam was in the garden of delight, the garden of pleasure, the garden of perfection, and he still had a job to do. Because God wants our humanness filled with purpose. He wants us to have a purpose for our lives. And God's got a purpose for your life. And some people view work, look at your outlines. When it comes to work, some are going to idolize it. Some will idolize work. They make making that dollar, that's all it's about. They're going to work long hours. Uh, they're going to do whatever it takes. It's all about the money. And, uh, you know, I, from different shows or whatnot, I don't know who sung it, and I don't want to get crucified for it, but uh, money, 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 uh, it's all about money, right? And uh, everybody's about money. Money, 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 money. And our whole life's about money. whole life's about money. We can't get away from money. Money's part of our life. It's part of a, it is a, a, a magnifying glass that shows me how my walk with God is really going. It shows me my heart. And some people will idolize money. I wrote down from my notes, long hours and total commitment to your job. Now, please listen closely. This is going to sound crazy to you. This is why I, I failed. And I'm going to explain myself. Long hours and total commitment to your job. It sounds very noble. And once you get in the ministry, it's, oh, man, that's, that's our pastor. That, that's our assistant. That's our youth pastor. Long hours, commitment, man, always there. Well, let me just tell you the reverse of that. Long hours and total commitment to the job, irregardless of what that job is. Long hours and total commitment to the job means few hours and little commitment to your family. And I'm just going to tell you, whether it's my life, the staff's life, I try to consciously, from the mistakes that I've made, long hours, good gravy. Not taking days off, good gravy. Total commitment, whatever you want. But what that means, whether it's in the ministry or whether it's as a mechanical engineer, what that means is long hours and total commitment to your job. I didn't say to the Lord, isn't it amazing how we confuse those two? Long hours and total commitment to the job means few hours and little commitment to your family. And there's going to come a point in day that we've traded out our kids for a truck. We've traded out our kids for a possession. There are times that you have with your kids right now, sit down, let the ice cream melt, let them get sticky and messy. Throw them in the stinking pool. Make sure they got a life preserver on. Enjoy time with them. Because they're going to get bigger. And they're going to grow up real quick. And some of the stuff that we traded out for our family, we're looking back on now, and it's not worth it. Uh, listen, the, the things of land, the things of houses, the things of materialism, the things of pleasure, th those type things. I'm, I'm telling you this, there's definitely coming a day, I do not know when it will be in your life. But those long hours and total commitment, not, not because you wanted to be a good worker, not because you wanted to glorify God in it, but because you were totally ate up, whether it was with making money or the reputation that it gave you, you were so ate up with it that you will look at a wife, you will look at a family, if they're still around that you will have missed so much time with because please understand this principle I've only got so many hours you've only got so many hours in each and every day and long hours and total commitment to a job the reverse of that we would all have to say amen or oh me deeply within our soul long hours and total commitment to a job means low commitment and a few hours with the family and there's going to come a point in day that when you need your family they're going to be gone and that job that you thought was going to be there for you it's going to be amazing how quickly they'll fire you or get rid of you once you reach a point in place of your age where it's better to buy you out with three years of salary than to give you what you've got coming after you spent 30 years with them some will idolize work God, he said in Matthew 6 24 man you can't serve God in mammon it's impossible so don't idolize it it just uses you money is a tool for God to fulfill his purpose through your life some will idolize work some will avoid work this group right here drives me crazy they spend more time trying to get out of work than they do just getting a stupid job done now when you go to work can I can I just be can I be honest this morning 
You be the best worker on your job. And stop using Jesus Christ as an excuse for you to take a 30-minute break from doing your job. When you got a job to do, you get your blooming job done. When God gives you a break, you get you a Coca-Cola, some orange crackers with peanut butter in the middle. They got a little touch of God on them this week. Are y'all with me? Amen? You can sit down at the break room and talk to them about Jesus Christ. And when that break's over with, you don't take a minute more. You get your tail in back to work. You do a good job. You honor the Lord Jesus Christ. You put in a day's labor, a day's work. You, your boss gets more out of you than what your boss puts into you. You be a good labor. Because I'm telling you something. Some people are A-OK with letting everybody else do the work and them getting all the blessings from it. And it's killing America. It's killing our families. And it's killing the house of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some folks are like, I can't believe these freeloaders in America. I can't believe that they would do this. I work hard. I do right. And all they do is just enjoy the benefits of it. Now, can I be real honest this morning? Are you still going to love me if I'm real honest this morning? I can't hear you, amen? Can I be honest this morning? Are you going to get mad? All right, here goes. Some of y'all are freeloaders. You get mad at everybody in the United States of America for living off your tax dollars, but you come to the house of God and the air conditioning and the preaching and the serving and the youth ministry and the children's ministry and the song music ministry and all that stuff, and you never put anything in. Now, you want to get mad at everybody in the United States. Is anybody with me? Now, you said you weren't going to get mad. But you see what happens with finances, don't you? And we get mad at everybody else for taking advantage of you. But if you're not careful when it comes to the house of God, you'll let the 80-year-olds tithe. You'll let the ones on Social Security give. You'll let the ones that have gray hair sacrifice. You'll let them bleed and sweat and hurt. They can't pay for their medicine. They don't get a raise. They've got my heart. But I'm going to be honest with you. Some of y'all got strength and you've got age and you've got youth. And you know of all the preachers you've ever met. I'm the least one about your stinking money. But you're freeloading. You're freeloading off the house of God. And once you get tired of freeloading here, all you're going to do is freeload somewhere else. Why? Because you've never understood what money is all about. You've never understood the joy of finances. You never walk close enough to God to understand He's going to meet all your needs. You filled your heart so full of your toys that there's no room for Jesus Christ. And all I'm saying is this. We all in the uproar about the welfare system. But there's a welfare system in the house of God that has crippled God's church. It's made it where we can't reach out like we need to. It's made it where missionaries can't be supported like we need to. We can't dream and have visions about new ministries. We can't dream and have visions about starting new churches. Why? Because I don't mind my money being for me. But I don't think it's for God. Are y'all with me? And so we idolize it. We avoid it. We avoid giving. We avoid sacrificing. Paul told them in Thessalonians, if you don't work, you don't eat. I, well, amen. I think this is the only church I know where y'all preach at me more than I preach at y'all. So some idolize work, some avoid work, and some abuse it. There's some that's going to accept deals under the table. There are those that will fudge numbers and sales quotes. There are those that will say anything to get the sale. Proverbs calls them a false balance, and they're an abomination to the Lord. Abomination means it makes God want to puke. A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. There's an ethical way to do business. There's an ethical way to get gain. There's an ethical way to handle your life. And there's an ethical way to do your taxes. Everybody wants to cheat the government. Everybody wants to be dishonest. Everybody wants to hire an accountant to make sure they can get by what they get by with. But I want you to understand this. A hundred dollars ain't worth it. A thousand dollars ain't worth it to be able to look to the God of heaven with a clear conscience. And he says, render unto Caesars the things that are Caesars. And render unto God the things that are God's. But all of a sudden our mindset's messed up. We want to earn that money. We want to hold on to our money. We want to keep a hold of our money. It's our money. And sister, it's not yours. Brother, it is not yours. Tony, it is not yours. Everything that I have belongs to God. I'm not an owner. I'm a steward of, the, of all that God has given. God's given the ability to get wealth. And God's given the ability to earn. And God's given the ability to invest. But it's all God's. It's not mine. It belongs to Him. And I need to be a good worker. I need to give you a fair day's work. And then some, because I'm doing it, as unto the Lord. I need to remember that God in heaven wants me to earn all I can. But I ain't supposed to worship a bit of it. Amen or no? Now, are you dishonest? Are you dishonest? You got sneaky business practices? Everybody wanted to play the lottery. 
I don't care if you play the lottery, but man, I want to buy my Coca-Cola and candy bar first. Glory to God. I am so tired of, I want a 16, 24, 36. I got so tired of the other day up here on Almond Road. I'm like, just throw in a 14, 24, and 18 as well. I'm like, if you're having that much fun, fun buying them, and you're going to make me wait, at least get enough to make it worth your while. Why do we buy the lottery? Money laundering. People smart enough to go ahead and wash out that dirty money. It's dirty money. Shady business practices. Lying to folks to get to what you want. Doing, doing things that's going to dishonor God. Lying to the IRS. God's people are going to give judgment one day. I believe you need to be as wise as you can do and you give as much to God as you can give to God. But I'm going to tell you something. that uh, There's a testimony involved. Somebody looked at me and says, why in the world do you spend so much money having an accountant do your taxes? I was like, it's not because of what I make. I was like, it's because of who I am. And I was like, it's worth it. It's worth it to me to have somebody's name on everything that I turn in. I said, I don't like paying that much money. I said, I like to take that money and use it for God's work. But I do it for one reason and one reason alone. They can audit me. They can check me. They can strip me down. They can do whatever they want to financially. And I may be found wrong, but it's not going to be because my heart was hidden. And I told an accountant to do things that were shady and that were crooked and that were, that were not right before a holy God. See, there's getting gained the right way and there's getting gained the wrong way. And we get so into getting gained that if we've got to break a few rules and cross a few lines, I'm sure that God will understand. And all I'm telling you is this. You go by the name of God. You go through the blood of Jesus Christ. You belong to Him. You call yourself a Christian. Praise the Lamb of God. You earn all you can. You work your tail off. You improve yourself. You study. You become where everybody in the county wants to hire you. But don't be dirty on what you do with your money. Because God looks down and God wants to, you to earn all you can the right way. But stop worshiping the money. Because it's going to be a mm, money. Money's a good servant. But it's a cruel master, church. And so number one, it's not wrong to earn money. It's wrong to worship it, keywords, purpose. Number two, it's not wrong to save money. It's just wrong to be selfish. And the key word there is contentment. See, saving deals with my spending. I want you to look at me for a minute, okay? Y'all, y'all, if y'all are still with me, say amen. amen. If y'all coming back next week, say amen. amen. Oh, wow, okay, good. I feel better. Well, I, I don't cover this much, so might as well be honest with it, right? All right, how many of y'all would like to have a raise? Raise your hand. I mean, it's okay. This is not a trick question. Yeah, some of y'all are like, I ain't raising my hand. How many, how many would like a raise? Raise your hand. Thank you, Brother Rand. I mean, uh, how many of y'all like a raise? If you ain't got your hand raised, you're lying. How many of y'all want to be liars? Now, how many of y'all want a raise? I want to tell you how to get a raise. You want to give yourself a raise? Change how you spend your money. You want a raise this morning? Change how you spend your money. That went over well. Thank God for for coffee, latte, medium rare, whatever. Somebody said, why don't you go to Starbucks? I said, I'm not smart enough. (laughs) Do you know how I feel? What you want, coffee? What temperature? Hot. What you want in it? Coffee. You ever look, see how much latte, cafe, mooche, you with me? If you looked at your spending, you get yourself a raise. You got rid of some of the toys. And again, I'm not against things. I'm not. If you've been around me, some of y'all have been going, <gasps> I'm not. I'm not. But man, we don't got things. Things got us. We get ourselves in so much debt, we can't see straight. You know, one of the top three marital dividers is all is money. Every time, money, 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 money. And so all of a sudden, I want you to earn all you can. I don't want you to worship it. I think biblically the Bible teaches that I want you to save all you can. But stop being, stop, stop being selfish with it. And stop, I want you to understand this principle. Ready? I wrote this down for myself. I do not have to buy everything. I, I, I do not have to buy everything I want just because I can. Well, I've earned this money. I'll get what I want to. You have that right. Some people have saved, worked hard, lived their life, been frugal, been wise with their money, and they want to go buy eggs. God bless them. It's not them that scares me. It's the ones that are 35 years younger they are that want to buy the same thing 35 years before they should and put it on credit for the next 30 years. It's killing us. It's killing your family. 
If it's killing your kids, it's killing your giving, it's killing your joy, it's killing your marriage, it's killing you. We can't save money because we're selfish. We got to hoard it up for ourselves. It's my money. It's what I want to do with it. Somebody goes on a $7,000 vacation. And so you got to go on an $8,000 vacation. Can I only tell you if you're young, you don't need to go on a $7,000 vacation. You need to go to the Motel 6. You want everything your mom and daddy's got. And mom and daddy put 40 years into that deal. You're starting out. Save your money. Walk with God. Love Jesus. Put Him first in your life. Learn to labor. Learn to sweat. Learn to sacrifice. You don't have to have everything your mom and daddy have. How many of y'all remember when you started out? See, I, the young people, they got so much debt, they don't know what it's like to dig for coins in the couch. That's, that's foreign to them. The only thing they digging out of the couch is looking for their controller for the video game. It's killing us, folks. We put everything on debt. We charge everything. Credit cards come in all the time. Get this credit card. Get that credit card. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Man, them things come due, brother. They're coming due for your family. They come due for your house. They come due for your cars. All that, it's all coming due. And so all of a sudden, I can't save any money because I'm spending more than I've got coming in. I've got to have everything. I've got to have this new gadget. And boy, I tell you what, I wish the house of God was named Apple. Because whatever Apple puts out, people got to have it. I'm thinking about getting a Bible and putting half-eaten apple on it. Are y'all with me? How much in cell phones we, we purchasing? Got to have this new cell plan. Did you ever think, some of y'all ain't old enough for this. Did y'all ever think 25 years ago that we'd be excited that we got a deal on our cell phone plan and all we're paying is $200 a month? Did you ever think that you'd be looking 25 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, did you ever think we'd be looking at six-year-olds six year holding iPads and, and tablets? I'm not against gadgets. I'm not against all that kind of, I don't like them, but I'm not against them. I don't think I, iPads and tablets ought to be raising your kids. I think you ought to. You're the mom and daddy. Amen. But I'm not going to handle that this morning. But you've got to have the latest of this and the latest of that and the newest of this and the newest of that. You don't know what it's like to pray that a car gets home. You know, everybody wants to laugh. Everybody give the car just a, a name. My cars have always been named. That's right. I'm very grateful for what you've allowed me to get. But man, if I give you the names of the cars that I've driven over my life, even when I travel thousands and thousands of miles, it would embarrass me from behind the pulpit. Remember, I know what it's like to pray them home. And nobody laughs about that. You would laugh at me if I, if I told you the times that I've prayed that God would fix an ailment in my car because I didn't have the money. You would laugh. Some of y'all have been there where you didn't have the money to pay for your kids going to the hospital or the doctor. You remember begging God for it? We didn't put everything on charge cards. We charged heaven with it. We ask God to help us. You know what it's like to look and watch your wife drive on tires where the steel's coming through and you ain't got the money? You can't go and put on credit. No, you didn't have the money for it. You didn't put on credit. You know what it's like to beg God and ask God, now God keep her safe. If one of us has got a wreck, would you make it my tires? You ever pray and ask God to God give you some money? You ever ask God to help you in your life? See, we spend it and we charge it and we spend it and we charge it. And we don't know what it's like to experience the blessings of God. Don't have any food. I'm not talking about don't have any filet mignon. I'm talking about you ain't got no cheap chicken bologna. You ain't got, you ain't got Vienna sausages. You ain't got no peanut butter. You ever scrape the peanut butter that was so thin and you put it on your bread that was stale that all you could do was smell the peanuts because there wasn't enough peanut butter on there to taste it? You remember them days. And yet God showed himself mighty and God showed himself strong. But we've gotten to such a, to such a point in our life. We can't save anything because we've got to have everything. We've got to spend and spend and get and get. We'll go to the restaurants. We'll throw, it, throw down $50 here, $75 there. We'll go to this store and get that. We'll go to Walmart and get that. Man, between Apple and Dollar General, the killing God's people. Dollar General, how many of y'all ever went to Dollar General? Just wanted one thing, $2.99. How many of you women came out with $30 worth of nothing? 
I'm spending. Spending. Saving's going to deal with my, my, my spending. Saving's going to deal with my spiritual life. Saving's going to show me what's in my heart. Saving's going to show me am I really content. Saving's going to show me what do I really love. Saving's going to help, help me within my life. Philippians 4 and James 5. Dealing with my saving. Dealing with my saving. Cutting down on my spending. My standard of living may go up. But does my standard of giving go up? See, I want to earn all I can. I want you to be in, 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 um, industrious. I want you to be entrepreneurial. I want God to use all your abilities. I want you to be well paid. I want you to be valuable to your boss. I want you to be an asset to your company. I want you to go in. I, I wish they would say, man, I don't know what Newton Baptist Church is turning out, but I want to see if Newton Baptist Church has got some more workers. I want you to be honest. Hard working, an advantage to your company. I want them to be glad that they hired you. You learn to work. Young people, learn to work. Work yourself hard. You're there to work. You're not there to text. You're not there to email. You're not there to Google. You're not there to listen to Spotify. You're there to work. Work when you're there. Work when you're there. Work when you're there. Work when you're there. Can somebody say amen? amen. Work, amen. But now understand this, earning all you can, working all you can, but the glory of God in balance. Just make sure you don't worship it. It's not wrong to save money. Now be careful of being selfish. Then let me close with this, my time's gone. It's not wrong to give money. There's no, there's no extra on that. It's not, it's not wrong, number one, to earn money. It's wrong to worship it. Key words, purpose. Number two, it's not wrong to save money. It's wrong to be selfish. Key words, contentment. Number three, it's not wrong to give money. And the key words, Generosity. And I didn't do this on purpose, but it did tickle me when I got to the end of this thing and I looked at the key words of purpose, contentment, and generosity, I, I giggled. Because God's purpose for my money and my possessions is that I would be content so that I'd be able to give like I've never been able to give before and be generous. Now, God wants you to be generous. I, I tell you this, be careful of being careless. I read this and, and uh, th this stung. I had several things that this, this, this stung me. Be wise in setting boundaries of how much you, you will give. Because others do not have any boundaries of how much they're going to take. Anybody ever helped somebody and couldn't get rid of them? I don't mean it ugly. Now every time they get around you, it's all, I, just, I just want to share this need. I just want to share this need. I want to share this need. I had to tell a guy one time, it's like, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I've been able to help you. I'm grateful that I've been able to help you. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm grateful that I've been able to help you ten times. But now you need to go to God and let God get you some help. Because obviously my help ain't helping you. There are people going to take advantage of you. You still need to be generous. People have looked at me and said, I can't believe you gave them money. You don't know what they're going to do with it. I went, that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is not what they do with it. My responsibility is what I do with it. And God told me to give it to them, and I've done my part, now they better do theirs, because I'm not going to give account for them, I am going to give account for me. Are y'all with me? Some of y'all got burnt, hadn't you? You got your bacon burned, didn't you? And now you're going to take it out on everybody else because you got your bacon burned. I've had people take it out on the church because they got the bacon burned, got the, got the emotions on the shoulders. I'm not going to tithe, I'm not going to give, I'm not going to be generous because somebody hurt me. Somebody didn't do what I thought they ought to have done in the house of God. You got your bacon burned. I've had my bacon scorched, brother. I'm, a, I, I'm, just, I, I'm just a sap. I know I'm a sap. I know I am. Somebody came to me. Stacey and I were building a house down in Valdosta. Saved a little bit of money for some flooring she wanted. Nothing extravagant. Good gravy. It's just floor. And I set it aside. Somebody came to me in church. Oh, pastor, so-and-so stole my money, took my money, blah, 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 I feel good about it. I, I thought the Lord was, I, you know, I think the Lord was guiding me. I, I, I got to rest on that, right? And um, they missed church that Sunday. I was like, well, okay, praise the Lord. I've never held, any, held it against anybody that they would miss church. I said, you, you're, you're grown ups, amen. And I thought, yeah, they may miss church. And then it got back to me. Now, y'all know I have some sins that easily beset me. And one of those, I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm working on them, amen. But one of those is a hush. One of those. One of those is I'm a Georgia Bulldog fan. I, I'm, I'm trying to get over that, that in my life, but I, I, I do rather enjoy the Georgia Bulldogs, especially during college football season, okay? And this was during the fall. And it got back to me that the money that I'd given them that, that weekend, now I didn't get to go to the ball games, but they went to the Georgia football game. 
And they spent the night in Athens. And they went out to a fancy restaurant. And it was on my money. And so, all of a sudden, I look at my generosity, and I'm like, well, I ain't doing, I, bless God, I ain't doing that again. Let me ask you a question. Whose money was it? Oh, and that's what I lost sight of because I got my feelings hurt. It's not mine. My dad taught us um, some really good life lessons. One of the life lessons that my dad taught us, uh, and he really, he really, emphasize this life lesson he's like boys because we came from a little area if you know Maxie's Georgia up the road about 45 minutes that's where I was raised and it was a small community and they would borrow trucks from each other or shovels from each other or chainsaws from each other it was just a very small it's like 240 50 people and they would borrow things from each other and uh, my dad told us this he said boys if you ever borrow something from somebody you always return it in better condition than what they gave it to you in. How many of y'all with me on that? Amen? Now let me give you this. And the Holy Spirit rang my bell. Now I'm going to stand before God one day. I'm borrowing some things. Because see, I don't, I don't own them. They're not mine. I'm a steward. Am I going to be returning to God the things he's let me steward and borrow, am I going to return them in better condition than I received them? Or is God going to look down at me and say, Boy, you sure boogered that up. You ever gotten back something that you let somebody else borrow? And they boogered it up. You ever got something back from somebody that they broke? Somebody gave me something back one day and said, Boy, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about this. It broke. I'm sorry. I know I'm the pastor. I know it's supposed to be godly, but I wanted to, I wanted to in Jesus' name, for the Holy Ghost, I wanted to slap him and say, Go buy another one. Has anybody ever returned something to you that they borrowed from you and they broke it and gave it back broke with a grin on their face? And so I'm in my office. And God has bestowed upon me responsibility and blessings. Am I going to return it back to him broke? And I'll be honest with you, I just want to return it back in better condition than I got it in. Because, see, I'm not the owner, I'm just the steward. And so I want you to earn all you can, but don't worship it. Now I want you to save all you can, but don't be selfish. And I want you to give all you can. And I'm not talking about tithes and offerings to the church. Giving is not a Sunday morning practice. Giving is a lifestyle. Put yourself in a position... That God can help you to have purpose in your life, contentment in your life, and generosity in your life. Because God has blessed you and me to be a blessing to somebody else. Are y'all with me? Y'all have listened great. Father, we love you. This area of finances, God, it gets muddled and muddy and murky in the church. It just gets messy in our minds. And I pray, Father, for clarity of thought, that we would seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, and all these other things would be added unto us. Help us to work, O oh Father, while it's yet day, for the night cometh when no man can work. We're to labor with all this within us. So many beautiful verses I didn't get a chance to get to. And I pray, Father in heaven, that you would help us, Lord. Help us, help us, help us. Help us, Lord, to find purpose in what we do. Stop griping about our jobs. Find purpose in it. Find joy in it. Lord, not to live for the paycheck of what we can buy and get, or what we've already spent, we've got to pay back. I pray, Father in heaven, that you'd give us, Lord, victory over idolatry and covetousness. I pray, God in heaven, that you would help us to be wise. Help us, Father, to curb, Lord, these desires within us for things. And, Father, help us to be generous. Help us to always have an ear open for the need of somebody else.
and how we could be a blessing to them. Help us, Father. I think there's songs written about it that we would be your hands and we would be your feet. We would be your ears and we'd be your eyes. And God, we would also be your wallet. That God, as you have blessed us, that we might be a blessing to others.